Well, good morning, everyone. So last week, if you recall, we talked about the un undeniable authority of Jesus. We found ourselves reconciled to both this human, but at the same time, divine authority that was affirmed in both the Old and New Testaments. And so this week, I want to show you why this authority was affirmed and so profoundly established. Why God had affirmed in all of this scripture for it. Two weeks ago, at least I get the whichever weeks we missed for snow all mixed up. <laughs> we talked about how God is hard to understand. How even his own prophets mistook him for someone else. And so, because of that, we have to understand him through this authoritative measure, through his word. Because sometimes we can even mistake the spirit for something else. So we have to understand him through this authoritative measure, this raw and immense power. But we also witness this power isn't through violence and bloodshed, unlike, say, the Roman Empire but through this meekness and kindness, through this humility. This God that desires nothing but to glorify himself through creation, but even in that same instance, glorifies himself in creation by making himself nothing more but a human that is also divine as a mere man. The only religion that ever establishes this idea is ours. And so we know because of that, ours is the only one with that authority. Our God, Yahweh. This authority, when we are presented with it, this paradox, puts us at a, at a crossroads for change in our lives, for justification with God, reconciliation. It puts us in this place where we begin to wonder, who it just is this God? Who is this God that would want this personal relationship with me? Not only me, but every other person on this planet. And we'll begin this journey of justification in, this, in the story of Jonah. And so we'll, take, we'll go to chapter 3, and we'll actually read verses 1 through 10. Um, I had 1 through 5 and comma 10, but I actually think it's important we read, read all of 1 through 10 to add some context, of uh, some cultural context. So chapter 3, verses 1 through 10 of Jonah. Chapter 3. And the word of Yahweh came to Jonah a second time, saying, Get up, go to Nineveh, the great city, and proclaim to it the message that I am telling you. So Jonah got up and went to Nineveh according to the word of, Yahweh, word of Yahweh. Now Nineveh was an extraordinary great city, a journey of three days across. And Jonah began to go into the city a journey of one day and cried out and said, Forty more days and Nineveh will be demolished. And the people of Nineveh believed in God, and they proclaimed a fast and put on sackcloth. From the greatest of them to the least important. And the news reached the king of Nineveh, and he rose from his throne and removed his royal robe, put on sackcloth, and sat in the ashes. And he had had a proclamation made, and said, In Nineveh, by a decree of the king and his nobles, no human being or animal, no herd or flock shall taste anything. They must not eat, and they must not drink water. And the human beings and the animals must be covered with sackcloth. And they must call forcefully to God. And each must turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. Who knows? God may relent and change his mind and turn from his blazing anger so that we will not perish. And God saw their deeds that they turned from their evil ways, and God changed his mind about the evil that he said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. 
So the first thing we see here is the people, upon receiving this message from Jonah, well, after Jonah gets swallowed by a whale, that's always a childhood story I always remember. I never got further than that. I always just remember he got swallowed by a whale. <laughs> I always forgot the part where he actually goes and does what he's supposed to do, because the whale is always a story I remember. <laughs> and the rocking of the boat and all that. It's like, it's like why did those guys throw him overboard again? <laughs> Um, but so in after that we see this king, the royal head of this city, this nation. He wears sackcloth. Well, it's in the name, sackcloth. It's the cloth that they use to make sacks that they would carry stuff in. We see the use of sackcloth in other areas of the Bible. For the Israelites, it's a sign of repentance, debasement, devaluing, and humiliating oneself, and a sign of mourning. Sackcloth was made out of typically black goat's hair and was quite uncomfortable. It was very coarse. So this was not pleasant. Imagine <coughs> having this, I mean, you can imagine a king or a queen or something wearing this nice silky, some, whatever. And taking that off and wearing some awful, like, raggedy, you know, like, poking holes in a bag and wearing that. It's like, imagine wearing a trash bag or something in our context. Basically what they were doing. <laughs> and then pouring ashes over their head and laying around in ashes as a sign of repentance. I'm um, in Genesis 37, 34, we see where Jacob wore a sackcloth when he thought his son Joseph had been killed. Um... And it says, then Jacob tore his clothes, pour, put a simple mourning cloth around his waist, and mourned for his son for many days. And so, this isn't the only thing they do either. They go to even more extremes. They fast completely. This isn't just a normal fast. They aren't just fasting from food and, say, having bone broth or something. Or they can still have liquids. They can't even have water. The animals can't eat. The animals can't drink water. They even put the sackcloth on their animals. The animals had to be humiliated. <laughs> if you look back in the scripture, it says, No human being or animal, no herd or flock shall taste anything. They must not eat and they must not drink water. And the human beings and the animals must be covered with sackcloth. So I just imagine a goat wearing, with their legs poking out, this just, this, you know, having a bag wrapped around them. Just a very silly image in my head. So this, so the whole nation had to repent as far as the king was concerned. Everyone had to be humiliated. And so God was kind of astonished by this image. Now, of course, he knew, foreknew that this was going to occur, but I think anyone would still be kind of astonished still witnessing a Gentile nation doing this, that they would humble themselves and take this threat very seriously. And so this is an interesting thing to see because thanks to Jonah finally giving in to God's persistence, Jonah actually saves this nation. And it's a Gentile nation. It's not just an Israelite city. This is a Gentile nation that may have just heard, say, Yahweh in passing, you know. They might have heard the stories of how, you know, God has saved his people multiple times. But something must have stirred their people and moved them in a mysterious way and stirred their hearts to listen. They must have known the things that they were doing. Why would this person just walk here? And say, tell them all these things. You know, make these accusations. We must, we need to get our act together. But Jonah, at the end of the story, if you go further, he's actually mad that God saved these people. He pouts. He sits and he pouts. And God puts a, grows a plant over his head to cover, cover him from the rain and stuff. He was afraid of this outcome. He even tells God, this is why I didn't want to come here in the first place. Because if, I, if I, I knew if I came here, they were going to repent. 
And if they're going to repent, that means you're going to save them. And they're not going to get the justice where justice was due. Well, justice to whom? God is the definition of justice. And if God says that them repenting is justice, who are we to say what God determines as justice? And that is the complication when humans try to change right from wrong. You look at that in Genesis when we took the apple, right? That was our rejection of God's definition of right and wrong. Jonah was, again, trying to take his definition of right and wrong in place of God's because he had heard of stories where God had decided to say, do one thing, where he would punish people because they refused to repent. He wanted God to enact justice in a certain way. But this isn't the last time people do this, though. How many times have we seen someone, a murderer on TV or on Facebook, their mugshot, and say, this person needs to pay for his crimes. They should get the death penalty. They need to pay for what they've done. Sure, it's absolutely about repentance. But in this world of noise, where we're told 30 different things, and we're told to question every, every single truth of fact we're told and we're pelted with fake news, fake everything, and we can't can't even be sure that authentic sources of truth are even real either. How do we know that there's even an option of repentance when we're being told that repentance is a lie too? And this time it was clear. Jonah's time, it was pretty straightforward. It's like here, here, it's, it's A goes to B. Now it's A go, A maybe might go to B. If you're sure, it may be. Or you might try B or C. Or you might try B or E. People my age are given 30 different options and have maybe so many years to try out every option and guess because that's the world they live in. But I'm getting a little ahead of myself. The Old Testament, even in Jonah, points to what God desires. The salvation of all man and humanity. Not just one tribe, not just one group, not just one church, but everyone. But let me be clear, I'm not saying you're saved without accepting Christ. We only know what we know from Scripture. That is the best we have to rely on. Is the divine word of God, Logos. But it is clear from Scripture, God desires that relationship with every single human being that he created on this planet. Else he wouldn't have died on this cross. That blood has an unlimited atonement. It can cover every sin for every sin that is repented for. For every monstrous nightmare you can think of, that is the radical change that repentance has underneath God. <clears throat> This is why the Old Testament restricts us, and Jonah's sentiments here has to die with the old. But unfortunately, this human condition we have doesn't allow us to happen. Our human condition binds us to see the worst in people. The adversary tells us our hearts, the adversary meaning Satan, <clears throat> tells our hearts to see the worst in others. To fear those we don't understand based on things that are arbitrary about people. We see it in our communities. We see it in our churches. We even see it in our nation. We need to see that, that goodness in people. We need to see that good news rise back up from the ashes. We need to put those sackcloths on and humble ourselves again and repent. God decided that the people of Nineveh deserved grace. And this was before even Jesus Christ existed. Well, not existed. Let me correct that. Before Jesus Christ came down from heaven. And so I think that is saying something. Because God is consistent. There is context here that it's because they repented. But they, that was because they were given a clear choice. And the choice even then was that salvation was much higher in those times. But it showed still how merciful God was. He is slow to anger. 
quick to love. God was willing to be with Gentile nations even without the sun in the picture yet. Because he is immutable, he is consistent. He doesn't change with the passage of time. The only thing that has ever changed is the covenants and agreements we have with him only because humans fail God. And what we have today is that New Testament. And so the second reading I have is Mark chapter 1, verses 14 through 20. Mark chapter 1, 14 through 20. So after John had been put in prison, Jesus went to Galilee and preached the good news from God. The right time has come, and the kingdom of God is near. Turn away from your sins and believe the good news. As Jesus walked along the shore of Lake Galilee, he saw two fishermen, Simon and his brother Andrew, catching fish with a net. Jesus said to them, Come with me, and I will teach you to catch people. At once they left their nets and went with him. He went a little further on and saw two other brothers, James and John, the sons of Zebedee. They were in their boat getting their nets ready. As soon as Jesus saw them, he called them. They left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and went with Jesus. Can you hear it? This good news? When was the first time you heard Christ in your life? That it transformed you? I want you to remember that moment and then repeat on top of that memory these words. The right time has come. The kingdom of God is near. Turn away from your sins and believe the good news. That is the call we all receive in justification in Christ. When we turn towards Christ, we turn away from our sin. When we baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, we turn away from our old life. We become a new person in Jesus. At least, we try to put our old selves away. Sometimes, we don't always surrender at all. For many people, it's a long journey of branch pruning and improvement. Sometimes, we feel like we're hitting walls, and I understand that. It's a tough journey. But living with Christ isn't a journey that is guaranteed to be easy. It's guaranteed to be with others. This good news, this favorite verse of mine, Mark 15, read this good news. This is why I focus on the good on Sundays. Why I do not talk about how the world is getting worse. Why should I? Why should I be worried about what the world is doing as a Christian? Yes, I should be alarmed about injustices in the world. And fight those injustices, and love thy neighbor. These things are important. But one thing I feel we, we have started to fail on, and myself also, is allowing that adversary to get into our ears and tell us to fear God's creation and fear everything in it. That life is scary, and we should hide in our homes and be terrified of our neighbors and our communities. This is not what Christ did. He refused to allow such a notion to ever exist. He broke bread with the least among himself, he broke bread with those outcasts. That is the Christian way we practice. Now, it is a tough act to follow. We're talking about bearing the image of a God, the God. But we have that spirit of that God in us that grows and molds us daily into everything good we are today. So we have nothing to stress about on that. <coughs> One thing I talked about <clears throat> a week ago is the struggle to talk about the good news to people my age at Colfax. And I testified how at um, sun Sunday school how that is an issue. I'm well aware of the age gap issue that churches struggle with. And it is something that I've been, it's been on my mind for a while. One of the things that I know that people my age really desire, anything more than, than else, is authenticity. They're constantly badgered with images of fakery 
and people just wanting to sell them something for a quick buck. And they can't find friends and people who are telling them something that's real and something that's true. And so even when they are presented something that is real, they can't even tell that it is real because they've been tricked by something that on the surface seems real, but isn't. As I talked about the imagery of the morning stars last week, <clears throat> Satan himself was described as a morning star, enticing. But, even, but the true morning star is Jesus Christ. And so when you have bad things being enticing, you have lies being that pretty and beautiful and wrapping you up. You have the serpent, for example, in Genesis, tricking Adam and Eve. You have the same issues. And so this is not exactly a new problem. This is a struggle that all Christians face. It's just a different presented differently because now you have to deal with the internet and where it's from 30 directions instead of, say, five. <laughs> so I don't have all the answers. But what I do know is that authenticity is one of the things that they're looking for. They're looking for people who just act on that love and on that faith. What I do know is I've been able to have some good breakthroughs on dialogue with my own friends who had completely negative views due to prior experiences. And while they never truly converted, they at least now know what I am, the real way to act as a Christian. Amen. I'm not saying I'm perfect, because no one is. But what their misconstrued ideas were, are at least put to the side. And that at least gives them, so when they hear things, that they can then throw away those ideas. And then that good news, again, goes out into the world. There is a, this, this issue that does come up sometimes where you have to deal with people who just will not listen. <clears throat> and these types of people, in Matthew it talks about, when you come into a house, salute it, and if the house be worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it be not worthy, let your peace return to you. And whosoever shall not receive you, nor hear your words, when you depart out of that city or house, shake off the dust of your feet. Verily I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. Look, I'm sending you as sheep among wolves, therefore be as wise as snakes and innocent as doves. So what does it mean to shake the dust off your feet? Well, the, those times for the Israelites, they would shake the dust off their sandals when leaving a Gentile place to make sure symbolically they weren't carrying anything back with them that didn't pertain to what God prescribed to them and their, their laws in the Torah. In the same context, Jesus is telling his disciples to leave behind the baggage of those who will receive judgment for denying the word. It is not seeing these people as lesser, and it is about not carrying that guilt and baggage. It reminds us not to stick around and not to keep fighting with people and being hostile with those who are clearly hostile. It is for us to remind us to let go and move on from those where the message is not accepted. We see many people trying to proclaim the message in bold ways in totally hostile environments, with megaphones and things of those natures where it is not productive. It just makes things less productive. But I've also seen people who found novel ways with one-on-one -on -one conversations on, say, college campuses that then bring crowds of people who are interested in a conversation. So it is about, these passages are about being good stewards of our faith, our time and resources that are God-given. Ultimately, the point is this. I've seen progress. I know our churches have been hurt in a lot of ways in recent years, but I truly am hopeful that God is seeing us through these, these tough times. People everywhere are looking for meaning in their lives, and they and we need to keep these doors open and ready for when it starts clicking for people that Christ is that good news. This isn't a time of waiting around. This is about a time of doing. This is a time of the present. We live in the moment of today, as Paul would say, as if the kingdom of God is already here. If you noticed, 
Jesus immediately went to find disciples. Oh, if only I was as good as him. My discipleship group still at five members. <laughs> but he didn't give up. He, has, he, had, he immediately, his group kept growing even as people would reject him. He would still keep speaking out until he was crucified on a cross. Thankfully, we don't have to worry about getting nailed to a cross. At least I should hope not in America. <laughs> not, not anytime soon, I don't think. This is really the time I think we need to start standing defiantly against this turbulence and start saying enough is enough and start rejoicing again. It is time to stop being weary. It is a time to feel that good news wash over us again, that we are saved. And to let people know that despite what the world, what these 24-7 news cycles are telling us, there is meaning to this world that God created for us to live in. There is a creator that loves everyone. There are communities here that will love people as they are. Help them find their narrow path. That will sing and worship with them. And hang out together as joyous friends and family and laughter. And also traverse together through hardship. This is what it means to be the church. Following Christ. To be on a journey. To see it through the end. Not to see an end. To be, but to be on the journey for our entire lifetimes. Let us pray. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we thank you for this good news you, see, you give us each and every day. The news that makes us wake up in the morning and tells us it's time to go to work. The news that says to smell the roses and listen to the birds outside. The good news that says it's time to turn off the TV and go play with the dog outside. The good news that says it's time to go call an old friend and catch up. This good news is the one that reminds us our life has inherent value and other people's lives also have inherent value. And because of this, we have the duty to worship and glorify you through every action we do. Lord, this day, we repent of being fearful of the future and place our trust back into you. You have complete control in everything, regardless of what anyone else says on the news on Facebook, on the internet. We can remain confident of this thanks to your divine wisdom, your scripture, and your infinite glory and power. I say this in your beautiful name. Amen.